Hare Krishna Gauratan Prabhu, humble obeisances. Thank you so much for oh. joining today. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, how happy am I to be with you this morning. All glories to Prabhupada. Yeah, Prabhupada. You know, I, I, I suppose, unfortunately, we have never had the opportunity to meet directly, but I have been a part of the Back to Godhead team as an author and editor. And the others who are more in the managerial aspect, they have often told me about how visionary you are about taking forward our outreach through the magazine as well as in other ways. And that was my first introduction. And thereafter, we exchanged several messages. So today we thought of discussing uh, broadly on the topic of like, what is our vision for the future, Isco thoughts on ISKCON's future. So maybe we could start with uh, the perspective that you bring to this discussion based on how you were introduced and what kind of services you have rendered and your professional background also. So then we can, can we start with that? You could. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, please accept my, my frustrated basis and thank you for your wonderful service. And more importantly, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this very important topic. Uh, of course, uh, Jaitanya Charan Prabhu, my um, interactions with you and my comments and thoughts are not representing the GBC or the BBT where I serve as a trustee and a GBC member. It's really my private thoughts. You know, this is, uh, as you say, a spontaneous interaction. Yes. So I've been, you know, I have been introduced to Krishna consciousness in 1982. And, uh, you know, since then I've done various services, um, very much focused on, say, the, my greatest interest is in book distribution, book publication, translation and distribution. And I head up the African BBT here. So I'm, I'm speaking to you now from Johannesburg. This is where the African BBT is based in South Africa. And, you know, I chair the Back to Godhead magazine board. I look after the African BBT. Southern Africa countries. That's South Africa, Mauritius, and all the countries in the, in the southern tip of Africa. Uh, and, of course, we're also trying to do some service to Chilo Prabhupada's properties. You may be aware that the GBC had formed a a global ISKCON global property office. We're in the process of um, making that office um, the best in class. So Srila Prabhupada's properties can be preserved and protected for generations to come. That's pretty much me, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Nothing more than, <laughs> so nothing that's, more uh, than that's, that. Just to, that's, <laughs> thank you for that brief introduction. It raises a lot of questions. So first of all, you know, what you mentioned about the not the official position, but the individual understanding or individual realizations, individual insights. I think that's what is what we are looking for over here. In general, ultimately an institution is made of individuals and it is, so I think that's what we are looking for in this podcast. Even I don't officially say the monks podcast is not really, it's not a ISKCON mouthpiece as such. We're just having candid discussions and uh, Second point, so you mentioned that you are in Johannesburg. So I believe, are you, have you been, your family has been there for many generations? Or how? Yeah, we have. We had 150,000 persons of Indian origin arrived in South Africa in 1860. Oh. So, okay. you know, we are kind of descendants of those persons who came then. I had the opportunity to come to India few years ago when my father was almost 80, he wanted to see where his village like an hour past Rundavan, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. So many, of, so many of, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, very much because we school and educated, trained here, we, we much look like Indians from the Indian subcontinent, but the culture is somewhat different. Like I, for example, but my parents do a little bit. So, you know, with me as that generation, that language would, uh, you know, like my son, for example, may not be able to speak Hindi because we don't speak Hindi, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that is always a challenge. So did you have a, uh, like a somewhat of a Hindu or religious or spiritual upbringing or how were you introduced to Krishna consciousness and ISKCON specifically? Yeah, yeah. I, I come from a Hindu background, but at a very young age, 
I had accepted Christianity. So oh, I was okay. terrified of this idea of... Um, anyway, I had accepted Christianity and was very much a practicing Christian. Oh, okay. In my neighborhood. It was Ram Nomi, actually. Ram Nomi, April 1982. Um, there were some devotees having a hari now. And I thought to myself, you know, being a born-again Christian, I have to save them. So I went up boldly to them and wanted to get somebody's attention. Um, one of the devotees, they're being very experienced, had given me a copy of the Science of Self-Realization, saying, we don't really have time to chat, but have a, have a look at this book. Of course, I was very reluctant to take that book. So there was a push-pull going on for a couple of seconds in my mind. Eventually, I took it. And I walked straight home, I read the first 60 pages, and I was just totally convinced. Actually, this person who's answering these questions, he really knows about who God is. And by Krishna's oh, okay. grace, I've been saved by the science of self-realization. So this was in which year approximately? 1982, it was. 82, yeah. okay. And what was your, you, you were a student at that, your, what was the academic background at that time? Yeah, I was a student. Uh, was in what okay. we call here in South Africa, Standard 8. Oh, that was quite young to read a philosophical book. Yeah, 16. Okay, 16, yeah. And then from that time you got connected with the... Was ISKCON active at that time in 1982 also? There? Yeah, ISKCON has been here since, 19, in, since the 1970s, early 70s. Yeah, uh, uh, was, it, but was it quite active at that time in we. The temples yes. were built a little recently, no? Many of the temples in Yeah, well, the temples were not really at that time built, but there were many Prabhupada. Of course, okay. as you may know, the history of South Africa, it was pretty much the peak of apartheid. Yeah. So, so communities were living in different areas, and most of these devotees were white bodied. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were taking a great risk to preach to persons of who come from a non-European background, but they did by Krishna's grace. And you know, today we have over 3,000, maybe 3,000 initiated devotees, about 18 centers, you know. It's quite a vibrant Krishna conscious community. Mm. You know, this could also be a separate topic we could discuss about the, something like apartheid and the caste system and how Krishna conscious offers some perspectives. That could be a big topic for discussion separately. Right. Sure, sure. Yes, bro. So, you, what was your? Uh, you also you mentioned about your the 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 GBC ministry. What was that for? Uh, for a temple or property acquisition? What was the name for that ministry you mentioned? Well, it's uh, the you you aware that Shri Prabhupada in his will was very particular about how his property should be cared for, particularly emphasizing they should never be sold. Never in India, and even the West, if it's ever sold, it has to have GBC approval. So, you know, over the last 37 years, you'd see a number of resolutions around. And many efforts were made to try and, you know, create some system, especially with the trustees who manage, who take care of these properties. So at that time, you know, there must have been 100 or 110 temples, you know. Today in ISKCON, we have 1,055 properties. That's market value north of six billion US. There's an absolute okay. need to make absolutely sure that these are Sankirtan and assets of Lord Jaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Shila Prabhupada's devotees have worked very hard to secure them. So there should be some best in class system to insulate them and ensure that they are cared for and protected and they're not in any way put in risk. Oh, okay. So so you are also part of this team? And yeah. The GBC appointed uh, Tapan Mishra Prabhu, who you know, is based in Mayapur, and myself as the co-directors. Uh, okay. You know. We'll, okay. So, so was this in, also in, because of, I mean that is also we had one discussion, and we might discuss it briefly later about the kind of projects we are going forward. But one question: So, did you have some professional training by which uh, uh, you sort of had a specialization to take up this service? Yeah, you know, we've done the, a lot of work in, uh, on the property side. So, um, okay. It, yeah, in my secular life, we, we, we had a lot of involvement with, with properties. And, yes, true. Yeah. 
So two things. Now, if we, if you want, one of the biggest changes, if you want to look at our movement, uh, now this j- broadly speaking, I haven't, I have not been to South Africa or Africa, the African continent as such. Most of my interaction has been with in India and what you could call the Western world, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. But broadly speaking, we could say that our movement has gone through different phases. When we started, it was more of a monastic movement. Everybody staying in the temple and then almost a normative way was that everybody tries to be in the renounced order. And now it is completely shifted more than 90 to 95% more, I would say, not more, our congregation devotees who have a family, who have a career, who have a social, social life. So that itself is one of the biggest changes in our movement. And that has significantly shaped both, I would say, two things. Now, how we ourselves perceive Krishna consciousness, what it means, and how we share Krishna consciousness with others. You know, what is the mode of our interaction? In the past, uh, the main mode of interaction we could say was to use a negative word, conversion. To use a more positive word, we could say it is preaching. All the preaching also has a negative connotation. But now we have many modes of interaction with the world recognizing that it's not so much we against they, that we, that we have to make all of them like us. It's like there'll be people with different degrees of spiritual inclination, spiritual connection, commitment. And we need to work our relationship in a way that is constructive with various, various demographics. So would, this is, in my observation, one of the biggest changes demographically and then conceptually. Do you think that this is a line of disc- you thought you would like to explore further or you have some further, you have some alternatives, direction you want to take about the historical perspective of... Well, you know, in discussing is- ISKCON's future, I think you, you've raised a very pertinent point. The society from what it was in the 60s, late 60s to what it is now, has has shifted quite a bit, you know. I mean, look at it. You and I are from a grand disciple generation. Speak about the future. That tells us a lot about the present, you know, (laughs) that we have persons who are thinking about what would would be there in the future. So that metamorphosis where you move from a monastic in the temple kind of lifestyle to now where you have a massive congregation all over the world, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that um, you and I and so many other devotees are eyewitnesses to miracles that happen every day by Srila Prabhupada's mercy in the streets of Kali Yuga. And, you know, it's the congregation devotees who are doing that. It's the full-time devotees. That do. When Srila Prabhupada built this house, you know, I say it's a safe house. Hours a day, the most disqualified, unqualified, undeserving persons are brought into this house. They have a free pass. I mean, look at me. I mean, I, I, I am not by any way should be given any uh, uh, privilege to be anywhere near Srila Prabhupada's house, but I am. You know, and I'm not, and I'm the most unqualified person. So your question, you know, we see that the movement's expanding. Uh, we have some institutional safeguards. We have festivals. We have a lot of work being done on the front line. There's so many sincere devotees. And the, the substantive uh, part of that devotee population are persons who are professional. You know, there's a, there's a sociologist, uh, Rosabit Cantor. Have you heard of the sociologist? Yeah, Rosabit uh, Cantor. Yeah, I haven't read any of the books, but I heard the name. It's quite a respected yeah. name. Yeah, that's it. In the 19th century, she, she had done a study, you know, where she examined like 91, I think it was, or 90 plus religious structures to see, you know, longevity and their membership, etc. Hardly 12 survived 25 years. 25 years, you and I would say, is perhaps one generation. Huh? Mm-hmm. Now, the majority that lasted only lasted under four years. Now, today we are on the 4th of April, 2022. ISKCON's institutional age is 54 it's maturing, and we have, we have gone beyond uh, the institutional life expectancy. Now, if you ask yourself, uh, you know, how is this possible? Well, it must be that you know, the, those devotees have distributed so many books, 
attracted so many professional persons from the outside. And the congregation, or that, as we're saying, those two phases of time, today, you know, they make such a contribution to the movement. Like, you know, if you look here in South Africa, it's just unbelievable. You know, Srila Prabhupada said in one conversation uh, that my Guru Maharaj left in 1936. I started this movement. So even if the guru is not physically present, you must follow the vani, the, the instruction. So it's called success really is not that the society has changed so much because it might change again in the future, but that Srila Prabhupada is the, really the central, you know, the central person in every devotee's life. And it's the same for the congregation devotee and the full-time monastic devotee. Because Guru Kripa, the mercy of the guru automatically brings the mercy of Krishna, right? Uh, Shri Bhakti Siddhanta, he also once gave, you know, in his final pastimes, he said, the flow of devotional service in the line of Bhaktivinoda Thakur will never... Thakur was a, you could say, a congregational devotee. He lived on the outside. Huh? Yes. Uh, so, so, we, so we see this, you know, and you look at today, if you look from the time Shri Prabhupada was, you know, you know, we look at Iskand's history in the last 50 some odd years. You know, 560 million books have been distributed. Hare Krishna, that's a... 560 million books. Somebody on the planet, somebody on the planet gets a Srila Prabhupada book, a book of Srila Prabhupada, every three seconds. The Jameson Bible, somebody gets every one second. I was seeing, I was seeing uh, some sort of scores last night where last year we distributed the BBT team and the world community of devotees in the middle of COVID, 2,804,444 Bhagavad Gita, Hare Krishna. It's just totally inconceivable. Something like something like 35,432 sets of Bhagavatams. Now, the majority of this, you know, the congregation devotees have obviously put their shoulder to the wheel. Three weeks ago, I was invited to a launch of the Jaitanya Charitamrita by the uh, BBT in Kerala. Uh, Malayalam, you know, uh, and we're meeting the translators and the producers and those who put the book together. All of them are congregation devotees. And the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, they distributed 1,200 sets of that CC in one hour, you know, in, in the program. So you can see that the, 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 the contribution of the congregation or the contribution of our society outside the temples, as much as they get so much inspiration from the devotees that live inside. So it's a very symbiotic kind of exchange. You know, we get the, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that, uh, you know, nowadays we could say there's an outside or an inside devotee, you know, that doesn't, that's not there anymore. <laughs> that is true. Very true. Yes. true. So in one sense, uh, you, you could put it that, the movement is not just the source of Krishna conscious outreach, but it is also, you could say the catalyst of Krishna conscious outreach. If you want to, if, I mean, it, it's also one, one big challenge is how do we define the movement itself? Who is a member? Who is not a member? So it's not necessary that one central leader, one temple president will come up with a vision and everybody will implement that vision. There are many different devotees who may have different inspirations, different, uh, ideas and they implement those ideas and in some ways the movement is also can also act as a catalyst for the spreading of Krishna consciousness where individuals take it up and, and in one sense that's what Prabhupada also wanted. Prabhupada didn't want to centralize too much and Prabhupada wanted that the, the spirit to serve that should be encouraged by the management. So in one sense what Prabhupada wanted is happening while the demographic change has also happened in our movement. Does exactly it make sense that. to you? Yeah. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. You know, this idea of centralization, you know, that famous letter by Karan to Prabhupada wrote to Karandar Prabhu, it's got very specific circumstances to it, you know. Uh, many things in ISKCON, the GBC is centralized, you know, the Gurukul was centralized, the BBT is centralized. Um, I feel that um, that particular instruction, there are other letters which Srila Prabhupada encouraged because there are synergies to be trapped. There has to be a global think tank. There has mm. to be any institution must have a central intelligence. How to best, how to best 
engage different assets and resources to achieve a particular objective. And I take, for example, um, we have so many centers, and as I was saying, something like 1,100 properties, right? Um, that's 100 times more than what was there in 1977. Now, the point I want to make is that the, while we want, while Prabhupada instructed that we have autonomous centers and the, uh, the spiritual entrepreneurship should never be uh, discouraged and that free-spirited uh, you know, preaching and trying to, trying to give Krishna to others shouldn't in any way be inhibited. Still, there has to be some, some authority. Like I, I often think about, if you look at the financial structure of ISKCON, the ISKCON economy, in a way we are with the capacity we have in the congregation, the skill sets, the training, the intellectual capital. You know, in those days we would do sense sticks and society loved of books. Book distribution is pretty much diminished now because the Indian diaspora, wherever they are, they so readily give for Krishna conscious activities. But we've installed so many deities all over the world. And you know, it's not so difficult to think that if somebody took up the mantle to create, uh, say, for example, a, um, each temple or each area create like an endowment for the deity, you know, where people make a big quest or in the world they leave something because they're all congregation devotees. They're all working. They have assets. They have wealth. They want to leave it for, for the deities or for Srila Prabhupada's service. But there's no mechanism that coordinates this. Are you with me? Yes, Prabhu. So, so the centralization argument is there. And I could give you many other, uh, many other letters from Srila Prabhupada that, you know, would kind of loosen that argument a little bit. So we have some things we have to organize basis because it's necessary yes necessary, of course you know this Prabhupada also told Giraj Maharaj towards the end of his life and I think one of the last instructions was that our movement will spread by organization and intelligence so I guess the words have different connotations and uh, when I had the idea of centralization uh, and what you are talking about centralization uh, or uh, I think there are two different things over here one aspect yes. is that uh, if we want to be effective, we, as you said, synergy is required. Just one individual working here and one individual working there, it's not going to it's not going to be that effective. So you know, I was reading one book on spirituality for the postmodern world, and there are different metaphors that were given over there. So one metaphor was the metaphor of uh, warriors. And the other metaphor was the metaphor of creatives. That that spiritual the, the idea is that spiritual the spiritual and material are in conflict with each other, and if a war has to be fought, there has to be strategy, there has to be co coordination, there has to be obedience, and the whole me metaphor is about you could say standardization, regimentation, and then there is spirituality as as creativity, you know, an individual's inspiration trying to connect uh, oneself with, with the transcendence. So with that vision of spirituality, there is a lot of, uh, we could say, organization will be an obstacle over there. We will have to, so for such people, they need their space. So in one sense, our movement, uh, there, there, we could put it this way. So I was thinking, Prabhupada has used the metaphor of uh, warriors I think 3.30 per port he talks about in the Bhagavad Gita and many other places that we have to follow the like a military command. But at the same time, Prabhupada also provided space for people who were more creative and who had their own initiative and energy. So the challenge is that we want to be effective in reaching out Krishna consciousness is within our hearts and in the hearts of others. So in some ways, there has to be organization and which means some amount of centralization and hierarchy is required. But at another level, it's also that individual initiative and creativity needs to be not just accommodated, but nurtured. So maybe it's a matter of different individuals. and death. Yes, sorry, go ahead. What are your thoughts about this? I, I, I was saying that uh, I couldn't agree with you more. There's a delicate fine balance between that free spirit of devotee who wants to do something and should be nurtured and encouraged. And then the institution, you know, this point you made about Srila Prabhupada's comments uh, and metaphor. There's a, there's a figure of speech called hypophora. You know, 
hyperfora where you somebody poses a question and ans and answers it themselves. So this particular point you're making about organization and intelligence, it just kind of pricks something in my memory. You know, we say Shri Prabhupada built and designed ISKCON with his own hands, infused it with his intelligence, organizational design. Uh, so our future is very bright. But this particular point you made is that Shri Giraj Maharaj was called by Shri Prabhupada in the middle of the night. Prabhupada was unwell. And when Shri Prabhupada asked him, do you think our movement will go on? I said, yes. And he was suggesting, if I recall correctly, that, you know, by chanting and following your instructions, Shila Prabhupada. And then Shila Prabhupada replied with just two words, intelligence, organization. So he posed the question. He answered the question. Hypophora, that, 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 that metaphor, right? Uh, yes. Extremely important organization, the great Acharya, the greatest Acharya of our time. You know, um, in the middle of the night, he's saying this to his intimate disciple. <laughs> and, well, how will our movement go on? Intelligence and organization. So that's the, you know, what's required. We have to be organized and do it intelligently. Of course, say that, you know, the institutional safeguards are there. We need it. And we need to protect the doctrinal integrity that came in our line. But the ISKCON movement is a prophecy, really. It's a fulfillment of a prophecy destined to be here for 10,000 years. If, if you think, you know, you and I had to think of ways how you'd future-proof ISKCON, you know, then we would look at institutions like the Catholic Church, correct? They've been there for what? 20 centuries, I think, the oldest religious institution in the world. And they survived so many schisms and breakaways and, so in ISKCON, we expect some of this, right? Some of this kind of theological differences of opinion in the future, maybe, Krishna forbid. So there's, there's the generation after Srila Prabhupada. You're talking about that free-spirited, etc. cetera. There's, there, there's the current generation. I mean, the Srila Prabhupada's disciples will perhaps be with us for the next two decades. And so it's a critical period of what's happening here, right? There's a transition across... You know, it, it is their free-spirited nature that they've done so many wonderful and great things. But you need an institution to make sure that they can direct. We don't allow any kind of uh, things that which would be considered deviances to come through in the future. So while Srila Prabhupada posed an answer, he also said that the movement can be destroyed from within. You know, I mean, what did Srila Prabhupada mean by that? Of course, it's not so easy for ISKCON to be destroyed is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. As long as the GBC stays strong, Srila Prabhupada is in the center of our lives. The printing press is there. Brihad Murdanga is going on. Srila Prabhupada's safe house. The anti-cult movement tried to destroy ISKCON. They, you know, ISKCON prevailed. The, 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 this organization, this intelligence, uh, this thing requires like... Uh, we need to do then we got this thin very balanced about centralization decentralization then we got the free spirit of devotee right but the fact is we have assets on the ground oh, can our children and those who come after us continue the worship of all these deities we've installed so i, I i'm suggesting that um they need to be be saying, you know, to, to look at some of these things because they have practical consequences. There'll be a time when maybe we're not able to worship the deity because there wouldn't be funds to do that. You know, today ISKCON is powerful and strong, but what happens in 100, 200? Some thought needs to be given to things outside our lifetime. I'm sorry I digressed a little bit there, but I was just speaking on the point that you made about mm. the uh, institution and intelligence. I mean, I mean, I think that the, in, the institution is the guiding hand. You know, while you have the, you know, like the GBC bodies, the policy sitting body, uh, overarching. But at the same time, allowing that individual like yourself, look at this podcast you are having. It's your own individual idea. And it's fantastic. You know, so many devotees do so many things. Yeah, in South Africa, I just saw two weeks ago, we have a number of PhD devotees. So they're forming an organization called uh, something like ISKCON South Africa academic council or some kind of think tank 
where they will take things in a newspaper and take things and give comments on it from a Vedic perspective. So everyone has some ability that they want to offer to Krishna. A good manager must be able to extract that without discouraging the devotee. Sorry, I digress so much there. <laughs> oh, it's important. What you're saying is that rather than seeing, like rather than uh, if individual initiative is there, rather than seeing all the organization as as restricting the organization, some form of organization could even facilitate the individual initiative. Uh, I yes, agree with this point. Enabling. You know, say it for example, yeah. yeah, it is. I, I, I. There are some devotee academic forums or devotee intellectual forums. Maybe in one sense, with the internet and uh, virtual connectivity, this has become easier to have. So like-minded devotees can come together and share experiences and insights and therefore f- f- flourish in their own bhakti and their service. So that doesn't have to be rigidly institutionally controlled, but you use a nice word that the institution can be a guiding hand. So many people, people have the idea that institution means it will be like a controlling hand. But instead of control, if it is providing, the guidance also involves a certain level of control. But the emphasis is different. The mood also becomes significantly different. Any thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the institution should be nurturing, enabling, guiding. Srila Prabhupada said, don't ever kill the free spirit. You know, that, that's anything. I mean, look at the youth. Just as, a, as an example, talking to this point that you're speaking to about, you know, if we want to, there's a saying that if you want to reform man, you begin with his grandmother. <laughs> if you want to reform man, you begin with <laughs> okay. his grandmother. So the youth today, they are, they are the grandparents of tomorrow. And we are blessed with the energy, the drive, particularly digital savvy. I mean, we look at yourself, you know, uh, this podcast and other programs that you do. So we want to unleash the power of the youth, create virtual temples on the net, uh, virtual ISKCON. You want to capitalize the youth, you want to, uh, the institution. And I think it's a critical moment. This is an area of great opportunity. You know, the youth, you know, online strategy, uh, they're creating a spiritual supermarket almost, a virtual assembly. Because if you think about it, we have so many qualified youth and, you know, it's a wise investment because they are the invest in youths that follow follow them. So my point is the digital preacher, the institution, we have many digital preachers in ISKCON, but the institution has to also have a digital preacher, be a digital preacher. Uh, and the, inst- the net way the institution's voice is heard. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasai Thakur once said that the books will be of the birds and the beasts. Can you imagine the foresight and conviction of something like that? languages of the birds and the beasts. So the best way to preserve what we have is to do it on the digital platform. And we have to encourage the free spirited youth to, you know, to invest more on the, uh, to reach every town and village. Hmm. So exactly. So I'm totally on board with your, with your view on this. Yes, bro. And thank you. So now, as I said, the digital platform has its own challenges. And uh, again, content regulation, content filtering also becomes a big challenge because as you said, there are many, almost everybody can put their content online. So this could be a big subject in itself, but uh, say, for example, if some politically volatile or sensitive issue comes up, now we as a movement, sometimes we are, we are so transcendental that our focus is so much on transcendence that we don't care to comment on contemporary issues or we comment on them from a, from a very philosophical or abstract or perspective actually that seems very abstract to people so what you talked about earlier i'm so happy to know about that and what a forum where devotees in south africa in africa will be commenting on contemporary issues so that is something which is very much required but at the same time for that to be actually monitored and regulated that is a challenge it's not going to be easy to, if a devotee wants to establish, ex- express a particular perspective on a particular issue, 
it's not going to be easy to actually manage that and then also regulate that do we have some kind of uh, like for back to godhead we have an editorial review but then the problem is by that time the uh, article goes through the editorial review process and then, then we have the logistics for publishing so we can respond probably seven at least eight months after minimum is eight months after the issue event has happened so it's difficult to respond to events uh, in a very prompt way at the same time have a sufficiently uh, deep and relevant and you could say balanced response to issues so that's going to be a big challenge for us overall that's where the institution plays that oversight role you must almost like have a ministry of uh, digital preaching that sets guidelines and policy let us look at a practical example you know if you look at the internet and internet preaching if you just google uh, you'll see that their persons that Sheila Prabhupad is racist or sexist or homophobic and you'll see it quite quite uh, prominently on the internet you know but we've never given a proper response we've never given an official response there's a person Uh, as a student at the School of Oriental and African Studies in in London you know he wants his view, viewers he has a youtube kind of channel and he shows the cover of of Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is and he says that if you are reading this book i recommend you put it down to be clear the bhagavad gita is a great source of information on hinduism it's one of the best pieces of literature ever written but the person who translated it translated it and made it uh, made a commentary for this particular version is extremely a racist a casteist a homophobic a sexist now as devotees when we read that we are like quite disturbed by it right but True. the fact is we've never there is no response to you know it's set on a public platform we have a duty to respond and like that there's so many controversial statements even in shila prabhupada's books you know, which are serious they widespread Uh, they have the capacity to ruin our movement in many ways. They will misunderstand Shila Prabhupada, create offenses, misunderstand ISKCON. And this can be problematic in the future, very problematic for the next generation. They are unable to explain. So I really strongly feel there should be a transition team, you know, from Shila Prabhupada's disciples now uh, to the next generation for 10, 15 years. And they should be mandated to deal with all of these transitional issues. you know like even that race that uh, rape statement in the fourth canto of purport that shila prabhupad made mm. um there's a statement about the you know having a smaller brain homophobia use of the word demoniac people high class low class homosexuality less intelligent the views on early marriage polygamous marriage so these things are all there on the internet and you know if we have a transition team have some youth in there they conclusively deal with these with these these and other philosophical matters that are pending lying pending if we leave it for the next generation without the guidance of shila prabhupada's disciples we may not be able to respond to some of these things so you know to gain greater in, in, in insight into what shila prabhupada uh, had to say not only about contentious things you know about the vedic tradition etc you know there's there's a thing called um sainto it's it's way take all the indexes you know um syntopican syntopican if i'm saying that correctly i just remember it vaguely if you take shila prabhupad statements all from his books on a particular topic okay and then you take it from the great vedas it's like an idea based index uh, this called okay. a syntopican the publication that indexes and pairs a number of works in the same tradition then a lot of these answers to some of these vexing questions are there but because somebody has entered the the digital platform and made these aspersions and statements and we don't have a current or a forceful response it's like a disservice in a way i mean as preachers we we, we ought to create the balance in that whoever that person is that posted their view because shila prabhupada didn't make other views like if you look at the lecture he gave shila prabhupada in 1971 august in london where he says that Uh, whatever you may be either you are a poor man or a rich man a black man or a white man a woman or a man it doesn't matter everyone has a right to serve krishna so you use that as your preamble now 
and philosophically answer all of these other things. But the fact that we've not responded, we leave the risk there that these persons think that we're racist or uh, you know, misogynistic yeah. or homophobic, you see. So the, the, the digital platform now has got its downsides, but it also has its upsides. But if we don't have an institutional response, we don't have an institutional platform. Because imagine the power of the digital media. It can reach anywhere, any country, any language, any culture, almost instantly. So it must be a source mm. that we need to invest in. Uh, and I feel backing the youth, because they are most savvy and to do this, would be a great, uh, great blessing for them. And also, you know, uh, you know, of course, under guidance, it would be great for us. You know, I mean, yeah. ISKCON will be perceived more in the appropriate way, you know. <clears throat> That's true. So two, three points. First is definitely uh, some of the statements. We are almost like, sitting on a ticking time bomb. It's not a question of uh, if, but when it's going to explode. Fortunately for us, we can say that while these statements are there on online, none of them have become really very viral. And in one sense, as our movement spreads, as we achieve big landmarks, maybe we open some big temples or do some, some phenomenal other achievements, we come in the greater and the public limelight, we are also going to come under greater scrutiny. So we will need a response to this. And I, and I look at this at three different levels of challenges. Again, this is a big subject, but I understand what you are saying is that this is what we need to address. So, but to address this at one level, we need some internal agreement of what these statements mean or how they are to be seen. I was a part of the hermeneut uh, Shastri Advisory Council hermeneutics, we wrote a hermeneutics paper, but then the hermeneutics paper itself there is dissension whether that those principles are accepted and then some other hermeneutic principles will come up. So I'm not sure whether within our movement itself, we can come to an agreement of how these statements are to be understood. Now, one thing we can be very clearly said that we look at the preponderance of what Prabhupada's statements are. And based on that, if you look at such statements, definitely Prabhupada is not uh, biased against any community any gender, any nationality, any race, anything like that. His teachings are transcendental to those. But with but those statements are very much present and how to deal with them is a challenge. So BBT Edit is one website which has tried to address some of the questions. At the same time, I feel a lot more addressing is required. So I believe this. Uh, some of the statements which are come, come off as racist they must be causing a good amount of concern in South Africa and Africa in general, isn't it? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, we've taken a proposal to the GBC body and, uh, you know, took us a few months to debate and look statements, you know, in their, um, in their context. And the GBC body issued an official statement that ISKCON is a society, society you know, non-sexist society. Have you seen that statement? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we did a lot of work on that. It was kind of sponsored by by South Africa, and they've because it's a it's a it's it's a very real, very real concern. You just in Ghana, they had a a, a statue of in so in Ghana they had a statue of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and some academics in Ghana had perceived that he was. He made, you know, like so called statements and they pulled down his statue, you know, in, in, in anger at what he said. And he couldn't, they couldn't understand why the university was promoting him. Yet he's a world statesman, etc. you know. So when was this? I, sorry, sorry, when, when this was recently? This was in the last such? couple of years. In the oh. last couple of years. If you look at National Geographic, National Geographic, historically, some of its art has leaning towards racist you know it gave it gave racist interpretation on things so if I, yeah. uh, there were 12 editors in national geographic the most recent one was a lady she immediately when she took over appointed a history professor to look at all the history and to tell her tell the editorial board is it true so they confirmed it was true and national geographic dedicated a whole magazine to address that except 
responsibility responsibility for it and correct it. So these things are there, you know, we have mechanisms that we should exploit to try and correct these things. So society doesn't get the wrong impression, you know, of the most sacred and trusted and philosophical institution on the planet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Support so it. I yeah. just to clarify uh, what you have. So yeah, National Geographic addressed the issue of the statue of Gandhi, Gandhiji? No, or? no. No, so, so so Gandhiji was one incident. Yeah. The National Geographic, when the new editor came on board. Okay. Uh, oh, so they took up that in the past in National Geographic. Yes, for a hundred years. Oh, I remember that. I, I remember reading that. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. So now, of words, course, there are ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Just to clarify this, there's one more thing is that it sometimes there is a today's world, especially you could say the post uh, the postmodern ethos. it claims to relativize mor- morality and also absolutize morality you know relate mor- relate morality is relative in relative in certain aspects but we are the most moral generation and we are going to look at everybody in the past from our moral lens so there is a certain moral arrogance to it you know abraham lincoln was cancelled because apparently in certain cities in america including the city where he was born because he didn't sufficient uh, oppose slavery with sufficient force so which is you know he was to some extent at least a product of his times he was ahead of his times in many ways but he was a product of his time so you know there is also limits to how much we can pander to uh, to this uh, what is the word used for virtue signaling now of course i'm giving you another extreme of this that there is a tendency to just project oneself as virtuous and evaluate everyone as morally inadequate even his to venerable figures there is a certain amount of you could say popularity that comes by having a subversive view of reverence of reverential figures so that is often like a shortcut to popularity uh, in in the world today so not just popularity but also shortcut to moral superiority having said that there are also definitely statements and positions from past leaders which are quite uh, quite problematic in today's world so this is not just a, we could say it is not just iskon's problem with statements from our tradition and it is not even religious traditions having state having say problems with their own founders it is almost like a civilizational or a historic is the moment in history where we are looking back at the past and we are eva- almost the whole of humanity is evaluating it's a challenge that everybody is facing and we are also facing as a movement uh, does it make sense to you yes yes but you see the thing is um iskon is the foremost institution in the world that can bring real relief to people and we are in the ecosystem of a world that m- might take a very harsh view on some of these things we take like the united nations there are 4000 organizations affiliated with the united nations and there's 400 religious organizations that are affiliated we are not they try to borrow strain to get a you know a seat at the world table so to speak you know so this brings us to a point is our leadership courageous enough to deal with these things of course we are you know i mean <laughs> if if you can just allow me an indulgence here just to share share a few things we can't leave these things unattended to you know because um if you leave them unattended to then it has the full potential of uh, creating a full scale uh, misunderstanding and you know its composition in society uh, can become somewhat compromised because we we are in the material world and, and, and people do judge some of these statements on morality ethics etc cetera, etc cetera. But you know, the GBC body is a very dedicated grouping of devotees. They serve under very difficult, you know, deal with very difficult issues uh, to try and keep us going together. But you know, communities uh, must be the closest to the leader's heart. So if somebody got together, approached the GBC body and said, "Listen, we think these issues are really problematic." and the gbc body will engage some resource to to deal with it like we've dealt with in some aspects of that racism statement we have to maximize every ounce of our leadership ability to advance iskon standing in society 
you know, um, you know, we have so many things going on in ISKCON that are fantastic. I, like yesterday or two, or two days ago, I heard that in Hungary, the government had officially uh, given our, uh, you know, our school, the high school, full certification because they obviously respect the society and, you know, uh, mm. they see uh, the society is adding value to the greater Hungarian society uh, as we are progressive, uh, we're providing good stewardship, and there's navigational leadership, right? So, <clears throat> you know, we need to be be aware that the that these states, uh, because we're affiliated with governments, we have tax benefits from governments, you know, we have tax exemptions, like you in India, you have the Charities Commission. So society requires a particular decorum. And, you know, we should use our best means to write something in response to clarify some of these things, you know. It's very important to do that. Very, very important to do that. Yeah? Yeah, so true. So, in one sense, like earlier you started about how many movements, they die out within the first generation itself. But not only we have survived, but we have expanded. And uh, in many parts of the world, or not only many, I would say almost everywhere in the world, we have gained respectability. In India, there is a significant amount of respectability associated with the ISKCON name. In UK also, definitely. And in America, we may not be very influential in terms of numbers, but still we are not perceived negatively. So in that sense, uh, because we have a overall positive perception, Anything that will, anything that can be seen negatively or mis- misunderstood, can have a snowballing negative effect for us if it is not addressed. So, do you see any initiatives for addressing such uh, such issues already happening? For like I the fund- yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think fundamentally the capacity we have, the persons we have, the devotees, scholarly devotees who can respond to some of these these things. And I was speaking about a transition team, which I think is important. I think we have to look at the economic side. If we had means, better means, organized means, uh, because we are a voluntary organization, right? Uh, Power is concentrated in the hands of a few. We are speaking about spirit entrepreneurship is there. We're speaking about empowering devotees. These devotees can help us economically and Devotees hold uh, important roles in society. Uh, so we, we can't have like a knee-jerk reaction to some of these statements or what's there on the internet. We need a sophisticated plan, you know, uh, that must be well-funded, well-grounded, well-researched. Uh, or, you know, almost you need like a, like a ministry. You know, you know, I'll tell you something. Do you know what the budget of the GBC body is for, for a year? Just do, do you have an idea? It's 137,000 US dollars, a global organization, 100,000 US dollars. If you take that per capita split, say if there's 35 GBC members, that works out to what? Roughly $4,000 per GBC member. Oh. Our communications budget, I think, is about $4,000. If you take all the initiated devotees in ISKCON, you know, we're moving to the US cents, you know, and half a cent per capita or something. We take all the gurus in ISKCON and take this number of 137,000. We have 110 gurus. That'll be roughly uh, about 1,200 or 1,245. The point I'm making is that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said there's only two things real in this world, Hare Krishna and money in the hand. You need financial resources to be able uh, you know, to, to deal. Because nowhere in the ISKCON institution is anyone seized with these issues, are they? I don't think so. So the future of ISKCON and our reputation, you know, we, we need to be organized professionally today to put something together, to address some of those things. But I think we're a little slightly digressing there, but the, yeah. the you know, uh, on, on ISKCON's future, an economic plan, you know, where we were in the 60s and 70s doing incense and, in, you know, doing um, fundraising the congregation has come, you've got 99% people living outside. So there has to be a change in the thinking. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Take travel. Um, and ISKCON must have a very huge travel cost on an annual basis. But if somewhere in the ISKCON organization, 
if we had a travel desk set up globally and everyone just booked their tickets, I can guarantee you the commission and that will be more than the GBC's budget of $137,000. Now, it sounds very simplistic. Okay. And we can do that, right? But why haven't we done it? <coughs> because the institution, the, 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 only, when you, only when you're charged with something do you actually you know, um, make it happen. I was saying earlier on the value of 6 billion US, north of 6 billion US dollars. In Mayapur alone, it's estimated the valuation is done for 750 million US dollars. Now, yeah, you need insurances. You need, you know, uh, congregation needs insurances. They need life policies. I'm saying that besides the philosophical side, we need a global, like a ministry of finance and governance. Somebody who's, you know, we have so many actuaries and so many trained persons in this con, right, to head up this thing. For example, take the deity worship, which, which we're all concerned about in the future. You know, each deity has a congregation. If that congregation organizes itself through proper means, they could create an endowment fund, a corpus, a capital fund. And in our lifetimes, a few generations from now, the deities will still receive the highest standard of worship for which ISKCON is so popular because there's means to do it. So we need, we need means to, to be able to fund important initiatives. That's the point I'm making, whether it's philosophical responses, institutional gaps that we have to address, the responses given to outside world. It's important that we do that. That's the organization and intelligence Prabhupada is talking about, isn't it? What is he saying when we organize and be intelligent? Is it intelligent that we have so many thousands of devotees traveling around and we don't on economy? That doesn't seem like a rational thing, you know? That purchasing power should be reversed for the benefit of the deity and the institution. But this needs to be organized. That's the organization and intelligence, I think, Shila yeah. Prabhupada was talking about. Somebody needs to be the engine room to own the process to make it happen. Yeah? True. Makes sense now what you're saying. So, are there any other, you mentioned the Catholic Church is the, as the oldest uh, organization, uh, which is the organization that we know of, at least at a big scale. So, do, what is their example of centralization? Because in one sense, ideologically, I see within the, within leave alone Protestant or other denominations, Roman Catholic, uh, the Orthodox Church, but even within Catholicism, there is a huge amount of intellectual diversity. And uh, so, uh, do you have, have you studied any other organizations to see how this balance between centralizing to be effective and uh, facilitating individual growth ha has anyone got it right, or did Prabhupada give some guidelines about what we can learn from, or what are your thoughts about how to go ahead in this direction? Well, I mean, if, if you look at um, you know, we spoke about the the Catholic Church. You know, since its inception 20 centuries ago, the Vatican has never published accounts. Are you aware of this? They never published accounts of its investments and finances. Never. Neither has ISKCON ever produced. Have you ever seen an aggregated set of financials for ISKCON? You know, where the, all the ISKCON centers, because, I mean, ultimately, devotees are transcendental shareholders, right? We are accountable to devotees. So imagine the governance leap we will take if we are able to produce such financials. So, you know, if I'm just, just staying on this financial trajectory and, and, mm. and doing a comparative institutional survey, the Vatican brings in cash uh, as is, so, you know, as the, I mean, they are sovereign city, you know, in, uh, on this, I think it's 110 acre land in, in Rome, they have a population of a thousand people, uh, but they have extensive, extensive investments that incorporates banking, real estate, there's private endeavors. You know, the Vatican has such wide range economic interests, even have interest in, I think, uh, in steel, in uh, real estate, construction. And they have a number of charities. So the profits go to these charities, for example. They help, I think, 1.5 million children uh, every year by giving them food, which is what we do in Food for Life. And they support like 7 million Italian, poor Italian families. But the, the Catholic Church sends only a yearly tax to the Vatican, which it then uses to finance its different activities. Basically, what I'm saying, 
what the Catholic Church does is that they send money, not regularly, once a year, a specific tax. You know what they call that? Peter's pence. Peter's pence. That is called, you know, where once a year, different Catholic churches all over the world contribute to the global central office. Now, where ISKCON is, we don't have such a thing. We have so much of internal purchasing power. We have strong temples. We have sizable economies in some temples. Some temples are battling like in Africa. We mustn't think that religious groups are not challenged by shortfall of funds. If we had funds, we could do so much more. So to answer your question, yes. You know, even here in South Africa, I see there are many organizations, religious-based organizations that have rental incomes, etc. that they're able to face. So Econ is, you should have probably said, whatever you collect, we should spend, you know. But now we have installed these and we have so much of responsibility. We need to move into the capital phase a little bit, creating capital. And ISKCON has the expertise, the ability in its, in, in, in its congregation, et cetera, to create some of these assets and, and value. I think that gives you a bit of a perspective, huh? Yes, Ro, that makes sense. So at one level, we are two individuals, two, me- two members of the movement discussing this. Uh, and I'm also, are there, you mentioned about the dealing with the properties as a forum we started. So are there also actively the kind of th- initiatives you're mentioning? Uh, do you see this kind of things already happening also now in our movement slowly? Yes, we have all day doing some stuff. You know, we have the SPT trying to bring devotees together. But I'm saying some of these things are f- complex financial things. It requires special skill sets that we have in ISKCON, but there's nobody harnessing, nobody harnessing or bringing together that, that, you know, that ability. I mean, we don't even have a ministry of finance and governance, you know, yet finance is the heartbeat of any organization. Yeah. Yes. That's tough because in one sense, we do, we are all concerned about, because funds are essential for, any project without it nothing will things will not move forward but again centralizing it could have its own problems so when you were earlier talking about the catholic church not publishing its accounts you're talking about the vatican itself not publishing or no catholic church all over the world anywhere in the world publishes its accounts and what no, was the point about the vatican. vatican specifically the point the yeah point? I was making is that the, the Vatican is a central institution that controls all the different Catholic organizations. They allow them to function in the decentralized, autonomous ways. There's no pressure on them. They express themselves in various cultures, very much like how ISKCON is. Okay. But they do have an annual tax. Okay. Okay. So that's the, the example of both. Called this, uh, uh, Indi- Peter's, so that's Peter, the, that's, central sorry, coffers. Sorry. And they also have a number of allied revenue generating. Okay. Makes sense. So you need that hybrid, right? You need the hybrid. We can't with certain important macro projects uh, remain unfunded, like, you know, scholarly responses to some of these things. Or, you know, you know I mean, even, uh, you know, like taking care of our own devotees, you know, so many persons given their whole life to Krishna. They may be living in in countries where there isn't any kind of medical, some countries in Europe and the USA, you, government gives you a, a social medical care program. In some countries like Africa, you don't have that. So recently when we launched the Bhaktivedanta Medical Services, it's a grouping of 100 doctors uh, under the care of Sundaranandan Prabhu from London. I mean, it's just a, uh, a glorious moment because here yeah, you have devotee doctors who have stepped forward want to serve devotees, want to serve Vaishnavas, organize themselves, uh, creating a uh, access on the net. And that's, that's wonderful. It's those kind of initiatives that we need uh, to multiply. We feel that uh, we, we feel a sense of belonging there, is it not? When, this, when, when, you know, when we have these kind of interventions. But on, you know, on a smaller level, we have a science arm that might be underfunded, got important statements to make about science. But, you know, science is usually funded through endowment funds. I mean, it has any kind of regular or an endowment fund to fund its work. But they have important things to say, from the Bhagavatam, et cetera, about cosmology, et cetera, et cetera. So funding is necessary. However we do it, 
we, we need to organize ourselves to create some financial capacity to deal with, with very boutique I'm making. True, bro. So overall, this, we discussed multiple dimensions. So one thing which you mentioned about the succession, many of Shila Prabhupada's uh, disciples departing from the world and then will be having the next generation coming up. So uh, that is succession. Now, succession itself and succession planning itself is a huge subject with respect to the gurus, the GBCs and other, other forms of succession, whatever might work out at particular places. Would you like to discuss something about that? So that's also one aspect about the transition from the present to the future. Yeah, I mean, we've touched on that a little bit, right? That we need to have some kind of succession plan. Particularly, I was saying, you know, in this critical time for the next two decades, you need to have a transition team from Srila Prabhupada's disciples because, you know, they were the safeguard. They, they provided what ISKCON is today. But there are some pending issues, you know, that need to be resolved, either philosophical matters of tattva, uh, you know, like we said, some of these statements that are there. Uh, so this transition team can deal with deal with all of that. Or else in the future, you, 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 you know, one might ask, if you don't deal with some of these things and the left hanging, is it a potential for a schism? You know, a schism in this country. Because somebody could come up and, you know, in the future, some charismatic person and says, well, I have the answer to these questions. You know, it wasn't answered before. Uh, and then you might have you know, port lines. If you don't deal with things conclusively, you know, there could be management differences. There could be, you know, power invested in. For the first time, you'll have grand disciple gurus. Uh, you know, uh, in church history, we see this has happened in church history, that great East-West schism, you know talking about the Catholic Church. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that's what happened here, 105.4 or something in the 11th century. The 10th century, between the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, the first cracks appeared, uh, didn't really resolve it. Then 150 years later, a complete split. Today in the world, you have, what, 220 million baptized members of, even baptized members of the Catholic Church. So why is that? You know, this is a mix of political and theological stuff, you know, when you leave things unresolved and things are not cleared and somebody wants to propose a particular viewpoint, I mean, in, in our 54 years of institutional life, we've had some going forward in the next 20 years or 30 years, we don't know, you know, well, what might be there. You know, there's also like, you know, some devotees feel that our history is not accurately documented. If you read Jamuna's book, uh, Srila Prabhupada, you see how he's interacted with his female disciples. Mm, and in the Lilanko, pronounced or captured. So some devotees feel that there's a bit of an inaccurate history. Or well, you can get a social, devo a social issue that can divide us. Uh, you know, as long as the, we preserve the doctrinal. Of course, ISKCON as a society, we have this tripartite check, right? Guru, Shadu, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. That's uh, but you know, you, you never know. Uh, I'm just saying there's a need, an absolute need to have this transition team in place. You know, I heard the other day that there were some boars. You know what boars are? These are the animals that destroy the crops. So there's an Iskon farm and these boars were just damaging all the crops. So the devotees are killing these animals. And uh, now you, if you reconcile that with our fundamental belief system, uh, you can get into quite a heated debate. <laughs> quite a heated debate, you know. You know, from Lord Brabha down to our current spiritual master, the theology has been retained. It's one of the greatest assets of ISKCON. But you know, something to do with multilinguistic. A charismatic leader could say, you know, say something that may be opposed to what Shri Prabhupada is saying, and try and correct, try and offer some kind of reasoning to it. And you that you could create a schism in that way, you know. Like Srila Prabhupada intimated that 50% of his work is not done because it's Vanashram. What is Vanashram, you know? Uh, there's so many ideas around Vanashram. So I, I think it's important to have a mature discussion while we have so many Srila Prabhupada disciples on the planet. And the only way to do it is to have a transition team 
that processes these things. You know, Shri Prabhupada said that seven purpose, the seven was to publish and distribute books. It's a catalyst for everything we do. And um, in Shri Prabhupada's books, all of these answers are there. But the fact is, we do have the books now. We read them now. And we're not able to provide clear responses. So do we edit some of these statements out? Do we leave them there? You know, oh. there's this one called Mary Pat Fisher. Every couple of years, they write a book on living religions, right? And which chronicled, I think there's 10,000 different types of faiths in the world. In there, she writes something very interesting. She says that um, another unlikely success story is ISKCON. <laughs> another unlikely story is ISKCON. They adopt the dress and the diet of the Hindus. They live in communities. They chant and dance on the street to raise funds. And despite schisms and scandals, she says, the movement has continued after Swami Prabhupada has left. The reason I'm making this statement is that we must not underestimate the presence of Srila Prabhupada's disciples today. When they're not there, we'll see a very clear vacuum. And things that might appear, you know, like it's very often devotees say, well, why didn't we actually apply? But what did he mean by that? You know? So I'm just emphasizing this thing. We have the platform to do that. There's a reality in some of these, these issues. Yeah? Yes, true. I agree. There are huge issues. And uh, one by one, I think different forums or different wings of our movement will gradually start taking, taking up these challenges. I can see like uh, the... Now, earlier you made a point that we are ourselves witnessing a significant phase in the history of the movement where things are changing and we are ourselves, we, we are witnessing and to some extent participating in the change and based on uh, how Mahaprabhu and Krishna's mercy, Prabhupada's mercy comes, we can, we can be instruments in ensuring that change happens in a more constructive way rather than a destructive way. Would you like maybe would like to talk something about change and in general dealing with change as a as, as a part of the conclusion? So the Bhakti Siddhanta gave so many orders, Shri Prabhupada fulfilled those orders. So now we're in a, in, in a relay race to this 10,000 years, you know. Um, the conscious, in my view, the 4.30 a.m. across many cities of the world for thousands of years to come. Shri Prabhupada would remain the bedrock for the movement. His pranam mantras will be chanted to the end of the golden age, because that's how our society is designed. So in the year 2,100, 3,100, 4,000, you know, we would have the future generation because that spirit and spark. So these, the, the that special talent and competence that future devotees have, they will express it in the service of the Sankhita movement. You know, it's going to continue to grow and prosper. Um, we, and we're doing the same things. We'll be chanting even in the liberated state devotees are still chanting. <laughs> and the basis is that book distribution is really the, um, the cornerstone of what takes ISKCON into the, into the future. You know, ISKCON's relevance, in, in my just a concluding thought, Srila Prabhupada, he created this devotional renaissance. He gave practices and he gave doctrines and coming in traditions that are a thousand years old. As the Acharya, he repurposed it, he repackaged it, Srila Prabhupada would want us to plan and organize and be intelligent. He wanted the outside world to perceive us as, a, you know, as an intelligent grouping. There's an article called an article about Srila Prabhupada. It has a circulation, I think, of 5,000 or something. This was in the early 70s. And Srila Prabhupada really appreciated that article, you know, showing ISKCON in a favorable way. So where we are, our job is exactly that, because the more we become relevant to society, the more we can talk to them, because we are an evangelistic society. And that spirit that's carried in the hearts of generations, where, you know, we see in Kali Yuga, the temple is in the street, the books are the deities, Sankhita and devotees are the pujas. All of this mindset, and you know, what Srila Prabhupada gave, Srila Prabhupada gave us enough intelligence to adapt things in a way, not adapt the core, theology, philosophy, I'm talking about preaching instruments to become more relevant and to bring more souls to the safe house. So, Dhritana Charan Prabhu, I want to thank you so much for having the chance to speak to you. I think we've kind of went uh, quite across finance, economy, and, you know, 
but we kind of got the essence that Shila Prabhupada is the central figure. And you'd want us, well, organization and intelligence, those two points that you brought up. And we always need to be revisiting. Are we optimally organized this organization? Mm. And that way we'll have Shila Prabhupada's blessings to go on. Yes, bro. I'm grateful that you spared your time also. I'll try to quickly summarize. We're broadly discussing our thoughts on the uh, thoughts on ISKCON's future. And uh, I think we discussed four broad areas. One was the demographic shift and how there are congregation devotees who have contributed in so, so many forums, even temple trusts, much of the book distribution and other things are happening through the congregation. So that we could say the demographic shift has been managed quite, quite successfully, although there's a lot more even challenges. But the very fact that our movement has succeeded, has survived the first 20, 25 years, and not only survived, but expanded and thrived, become a respected name, reasonably respected in various parts of the world. So that's one shift which we discussed. The second is uh, broadly, you could say managing what to centralize and what to individualize. That is a challenge which we can't just go on one side and say that centralization is bad because we are a movement and if you want to effectively utilize resources, then some amount of centralization is required. And as an example of that, we discussed the financial aspect, which is quite uh, revealing in one sense that the central governing board, GBC doesn't have much finances, although individual temples have a lot of finances. And you discussed the example of the Catholic, ch Catholic Church and how it is how there is a contribution from bottom up to the church while the church gives independence to relative independence to the various uh, various individual churches to function and then we discussed about so that was the financial aspect and then we discussed about the generational aspect and within the generational aspect there also the two were related with the could say, ideological aspect generational aspect is that as Prabhupada's disciples are leaving the world then there are a lot of volatile statements uh, uh, controversial, potentially uh, controversial statements about Srila Prabhupada, of Srila Prabhupada on the online, on the, in the online world and how do we cohesively respond to them, coherently respond to them, cohesively respond to them. That is the challenge which we need to take up. So, you know, I feel each of these topics, uh, whether demographic, intergenerational, intellectual, financial, and individual centralized, each of these are topics for further, more detailed exploration, but in the rubric of, we could say challenges for challenges and opportunities for our movement's future. This is a very thought provoking discussion. Thank you so much for sparing your time. Would you like to share some final thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, I want to say the Srila Prabhupada's position is very unique. If there's only possible but a proper understanding of this. You know, traditionally we call this Acharya Purusha, where every follower is connected to the founder of the faith. In our case, Srila Prabhupada as the founder of Acharya is so critically important that every follower has a relationship with him. Mm. As you know, Srila Prabhupada is his instructions and his um, you know his his views are, are of central importance. So the success of ISKCON going forward in the generations to come, uh, the successes we have today is all due to Shri blessings. And we, we should be very mindful of that. Yes, true. Therefore, any, anything that leaves any doubt in the minds of society about the person, Dr. Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, we have a duty to address and clarify and, you know, and correct. So Jaitanya Chari Prabhupada, I want to thank you profusely for the opportunity to speak to you. It's the first time I've had the opportunity to, to speak to you. Thank I'm very you. grateful for the and uh, all glories to your service, all glories to Prabhupada. It's your service I that is you. glorious. I'm simply a, a channel by which the, th the services and the insights from the services, I hope that I can become a forum medium for those to be shared. Thank you very much and look forward to having further discussions with you in the future. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna.